Hello, my lovelies. This is Jenny from Jenny's Fun Facts. We just want to take a moment to thank you so much, Pete Eats Meal Preps, for sponsoring our episodes. New menu out every Friday, order by Sunday, delivered fresh by Tuesday. And guess what? They deliver to all Montreal surrounding areas as well. Healthy, fresh, and delivered to your door for free. Add them and our podcast on Instagram at p.eats underscore p as in Peter, R E P as in Peter, S. Thanks, P Eats Meal Preps. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Noon Hour Out of the Box. This is episode 43, and it's all about spaceships, aliens, ETs, you name it, we have it. We have a really great show. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to what is going to be another exciting show. As you've noticed, usually I have a co-host on this show, Esther Brzezinski. She's not here today, but there's a very good reason why. Take a look at this, folks. As of yesterday, isn't this... Child adorable. As of yesterday, Esther is the proud bubby or grandma of this beautiful baby boy by the name of Giovanni. He came into the world weighing in at eight pounds, two ounces. Esther, on behalf of myself, Jenny, and everybody out there who loves you, congratulations to you, to Fernando, to Sarah, to your baby boy. And we wish him the best of luck and all the best to him. The best of life ahead of him. Well, today, the, Esther is not in, but we have someone replacing her. But before we bring in her replacement for today's show, it is, of course, our usual thing to give thanks and to uh, give a big shout out to the producer of Noon Hour Out of the Box, Jenny Duhame. Speaking of which, is going to be my co-host today on Noon Hour Out of the Box. So let's bring her in. Jenny! Hey, Rob. How's it going? So excited to be here today. And mazel tov to Esther and the whole family. Woo I wish I had a glass to break. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm so excited for all that, uh, the whole family. I can just <laughs> imagine. Thank you, Rob, for having me. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. And uh, we couldn't have found a better replacement. I mean, who other than Jenny is, you know, just so fitting to be on our show. And by the way, now that you're here, I want to tell you face to face. You do such a great job with the Jenny's Fun Facts and putting together this show over here and Rob's Inner Circle. And folks, she's going to be producing another podcast coming up. Go ahead, Jen. Tell them. Tell them. Don't keep it a secret. What's the other Ooh, we get to reveal. <laughs> well, we all know that four-year-old boys that love dinosaurs love to speak about dinosaurs. But that's not the shtick with our Bobby boy here. Bob, <laughs> he loves everything to do with aerospace technology, aeronautics, planes, you name it. Pilot Bob. He has been working on this for years now. We've known his character as Pilot Bob. And now we have the show Pilot Bob No Delay. So I'm so excited. <laughs> Finally, it's here, Rob. <laughs> yes, finally. And we're going to be working again together. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we just can't go wrong with you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. So folks, stay tuned. There's an announcement coming up within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the 1st of May, around there, the beginning of May, we should be releasing our show. So Jen, we have a very special guest on our show today. Would you care to share with the audience who this gentleman is? Yes. I don't mind at all because it's very, very exciting. This is a great subject. We ended up embarking on this journey this week with John Emilio Zeno that uh, we were on Rob's inner circle. We spoke about the subject of UFOs. He is the UFO messenger. But today we have UFO man Michel Deschamps from my hometown of Severy, Ontario. So woo! shout out to Severy, Ontario. He is the UFO researcher. So we're so excited to be able to speak with him today 
as a continuance of the subject. But we need before, to know more. We need to know more. <laughs> before we bring you mind, we got a break for program identification. You're tuned into New Hour Out of the Box. So, Jen, let's give our guest that formal introduction he deserves. Yes. But before Rob, before we bring him on, I want to tell you a little story about how I met Michel Deschamps and how the world works. There's always things, it goes full circle. And I have to blame, and I will blame Frank Cavallero and my friend Silvio <laughs> Belmonte for this, because this wow. is where it all started about a month ago after we had Frank Cavallero on the show. Well, of course, my friend Silvio Belmonte and I have been working together for a little bit. And so he tells me that he knows Frank Cavallero. And I know, Rob, that you've been wanting to meet with Frank for a long time. You have mentioned his name. Oh, I know. We love Frank. <laughs> I love Frank. Hey, he's a great broadcaster. Yes, yes, exactly. So when we brought Frank on to the show, we started talking, and there was Don Emilio Zeno in our chat group. And we're like, <laughs> who's this Don? Like, he's bringing on some fun facts here. Like, I'm Jenny's fun facts, but he's bringing on some fun facts. So, of course, we asked Frank to be able to meet him, and he says that we should go ahead and meet him. So over the weeks, here I am, I'm talking with Don Emilio Zeno, and he's telling me about his passions on UFO and researching. So then I get a call about my grandmother. My grandmother, it's 30 days today. God bless her soul that she's passed. We're sorry to hear so, that. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. She lived a long, long life. So she's probably seen a lot of UFOs go by in her day too. <laughs> At 103.4. Wow. Woo! God bless you can ask bless for a better life, right? And such a beautiful passing as well. So after she passed, I end up at my Aunt Lorraine's. And she has her friends over. Of course, we have our little friends that come over and bring some beautiful truffles and some food and some beautiful cake. And here we are speaking with her. I get to meet her for her first time. And then the next day, she comes over. She walks in the door out of the blue and hands my mother an envelope right she hands her a piece of paper here it is the envelope i'm like oh okay what's that about right <laughs> so she hands her a piece of paper it says here's the information that i promised you that my husband was giving me and she goes well what information she says well you know about the ufos and i'm like ding 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 what do you mean ufos UFO. tell me more tell me more right so all of a sudden she says, well, yeah, my husband is a researcher. He loves UFOs. He's involved with a couple of people in Sudbury that are uh, involved and have had sightings and so forth. And I'm like, mm, OK, we need to talk because already Don and I are in the midst of talking. <laughs> and we're already concocting uh, things that are happening. Right. Exactly. So I'm like, this, this seems a little bit too meant to be because it's only within the little spectrum of time that all of a sudden these people are being connected to me and I'm Funny, being connected eh? to them. Isn't that strange? <laughs> weird. <laughs> Say it, Rob. Weird. This is really, really weird. <laughs> hey, there Jen, you go. I'm sure the audience is dying to meet our guests, so bring them on, Jen. Yes. So just really quickly is that I get a call or a knock on the door the next morning and it's this gentleman, Todd, this lady, Diane's husband. And she says, he says to me, I hear we need to talk and I need to introduce you to our UFO researcher, guest of the day, Michelle Deschamps. So let's bring him on, Rob. There he is. <laughs> hey, I like your little buddy you brought along there. He's my navigator. <laughs> He's <a> navigator. <laughs> Michelle, welcome to Noon Hour Out of the Box. Hey, welcome. I'm glad to be here. So, Thank Michelle, so tell us a little me. bit about uh, yourself, your passion, how you got started uh, with UFOs, uh, liking UFOs. How did it all start? Well, I was born in 64, and uh, in the late 60s, every toy that er that the that every boy got was pretty well space-related. Um <laughs> I uh, got interested in space. I grew up watching sci-fi, uh, but unbeknownst to me, uh, I was uh, surprised to uh, realize now how many sightings I've had since uh, since I was nine and did not expect to have as many as I did. Unbelievable. Yeah. 
So, Jen, you had a pertinent question for our friend Michelle. Well, actually, I just wanted to know exactly you being in Sudbury. What is it that drew uh, the aliens to Sudbury? I hear of so many sightings. You yeah. yourself, I believe, have encountered uh, UFOs or yeah. have had experiences. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those experiences? Well, I think the reason why Sudbury... Uh, has had a lot of sightings here is because we uh, we had the two mining giants. We had Inco and Falconbridge, and we have a lot of mine sites. And it's also the site of an asteroid impact as well, where all the mine sites are located on the rim of the crater. And that to us is what I seem to think that this what is is attracting the UFOs. Any any to see it to, to see any any developing technology or or mining. It, technology that would be the one thing that they would be uh, interested in if they were to come across a, a civilized uh, a society on a planet now <clears throat> other locations like blind river for instance where they have a nuclear refinery where they produce nuclear radioactive pellets that would be what would attract ufos over there now ufos have had a long association with anything nuclear whether it was uh, nuclear vessels like the uss um uh, I think the Enterprise or the uh, the Roosevelt, the the SD Roosevelt uh, ship in uh, in the uh, in the forties was uh, was allowed to carry nuclear weapons. It was followed many times. Um, so you have you have these incidences where, depending where you are, uh, that's where you're going to see a lot of UFOs. Now, um, I did not know I was going to have this many. Um, I've had a lot of weird weird things happen to me where. I was the only civilian to investigate a landing on Manitoulin Island in the, in the early 90s. Um, I have the only last surviving piece of paper that came from our abandoned radar base, which is no longer exists. I managed to grab a piece of paper that used to hang in its elevator. Oh. That would tell you how much weight the elevator would take. Because uh, the, the, we had snuck in the base a couple of times after long after it had been abandoned. It actually closed in 1986-87. Because they had gone to satellites then. They didn't need radar bases anymore because they were using satellites to uh, to see if any incoming flights from Russia at that time during the Cold War were going to take place. So they had no use for the radar installations anymore. And so I have the last surviving piece of paper, and it says Department of Defense, 1986-87. And uh, it's, 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 it's framed on my wall. <laughs> it's pretty neat to have. But my experiences themselves, like my first experience was a silver metallic ball that I was looking due south. So the sun was in the west to my right, and this sphere just hovered above the trees. And uh, there was a sock flag, like the kind of flags you find at the airport, though, with the red and white bands next to it on a pole. This other thing, the sphere, wasn't tied down or anything like that. But I thought at the time maybe it could have been an advertisement balloon. Uh, because there were some U-Haul trailers parked below it. Uh, there used to be a, an aluminum shed, but now it's all new homes built up there now. And uh, so, but that sighting was still like just uh, something in my mind that I wasn't sure if I'd copied it off the TV or whatever. But years later, uh, 87, 88, I lived in Niagara Falls and I went to a local bookstore and I bought this book called UFO Canada by Yurko Bunderchuk. And it had a chapter that talked about Sudbury and Eastern Townships, July 12th to July 15th, 1974. And then years later, in regards to Todd Frazier uh, that you met, uh, we subsequently tried to fill out some Freedom of Information Act requests to get some information from the government. Well, the lady there says, why are you bothering filling out the papers when you can buy the microfilm reels? So we bought five microfilm reels with all the UFO documents. I don't think it's all the UFO documents, mind you. I think all the juicy cases like the crash retrievals and all that, that's still hidden. But we've got, I've got all five microfilm reels with the National Archive documents. And I found two pages or three pages that pertain to the sightings in 74. Wow, so, so everything, everything coincided. Yeah, so Michelle, tell us a little bit. We, we've heard a lot about Area 51, but you brought something when we had spoke previously. You brought something interesting. There's yeah. more to Area 51 that we really know. Area 51 in the Nevada desert. So tell us that when you told me that 
is not very well known out there. Yeah. Well, Area, F as, uh, Area 51, for, for starters, is also referred to as Dreamland or um, Groom Lake. It's a, it's, a, it's a dry lake bed, and it has the longest runway in the world. Now, they've done tests there for the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71. But 15 miles southwest of there, there's a location, there's a, a site called uh, S-4. And that's where a young scientist at the time, he came out uh, in the open in, in the late 80s, basically describing that he had worked on a particular ship. He actually, his expertise was propulsion systems because he had built rocket cars. And it kind of got the attention of Dr. Edward Teller, who was one of the fathers of the atomic bomb. Ooh. And through one connection to another to another, Bob Lazar eventually made his way there and was working there on propulsion systems and basically described the fact that uh, this base is made to look like like just the surrounding terrain and the hangars open up at a slant of 30 degrees and there was nine hangars with nine different shaped vehicles that were parked there but he only got to work on the propulsion system of one of those and uh but there's more of, there's been more vehicles than that that have actually been retained. i have a list of at least 29 ufo crash retrieval cases most of which happen in the States, and people wonder why in the States and why more specifically New Mexico. It's because in 1945, 1946, 47, New Mexico had all three major technologies. You had the most powerful radar installation. You had the rockets we had recovered, the V1 and V2 rockets from Germany. We were doing rocket tests, and that's where they were doing uh, the uh, atomic bomb tests. So you had all three things that any visiting civilization would have been interested in, it was always located in New Mexico. You have the most sensitive uh, military and scientific installations there. And uh, that explains why a lot of UFO traffic took place and why there could have been a mid-air collision between two vehicles back in 1947. And were they emitting some kind of propulsion that an interstellar um, civilization might be able to feel those propulsions? Uh, we'd like to think, I'd like to think that maybe like Star Trek, you can you can follow a certain certain signature, like a certain vehicle leaves a signature or something. Like but some UFOs are so silent, if you had your back turned to them, you wouldn't even know they're there. You know, a lot of UFOs would actually emit sounds like beeping sounds, the sound of a, of a washing machine that's off tilt, off tilt. Uh, like really weird things like that, or even diesel engine sounds. Like in back in the 40s, I know somebody would describe the sighting of a UFO that actually made the sound of a diesel engine, and that, that got his attention. But a lot of times I have seen UFOs myself, which I thought I captured on camcorder over my shoulder back in the day when you could put a full-size VHS tapes in them, and I never caught the object because the light source was not emitting brightly enough for the camcorder to capture it. And uh, if and if I would have had my back turned, I would have also not seen the uh, UFOs because they had no sound. Is and yet, when a... that, oh, yeah. And when you check the website, I basically drew those two particular objects as sea urchins because that's what they looked like when they were lit. But yet they and were flashing off and on like faster than the light flashes on an airplane, let's say, or at a communication tower. Is there a particular? Uh, style of ship that we tend to see more or uh, we have our rockets that are more bullet shaped yeah but we tend to see spaceships that are more cylindrical or flatter or different shapes is there a a perfect shape that you would say that we can learn from these beings well i don't know if it if it goes based on the race or the the origin of the 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 occupants themselves but there is uh, on my website, again, and you can find some of these pages online as well, where they show different, uh, several shapes, several shapes. And uh, the reason why I stuck with the term UFO and not the new term UAP, which is Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, is because in uh, one of the head of the Project Blue Book, uh, Edward J. Ruppelt, actually, uh, it's his quote, he says, 
initially they were getting a lot of reports of flying saucer shaped vehicles. So they would call them flying saucers. But then when they started getting reports of square shaped objects, triangular shaped objects, cylindrical shaped objects, they couldn't call them saucers anymore because they wouldn't fit the size or the shape. So he, he coined the term UFO, which still meant something from somewhere else, not manufactured on earth, but because they had different shapes, they had to come up with a more generic term to say, these are objects of foreign origin, not made on earth, but definitely not just of the shape of a flying saucer. So I stuck with the same term with the same definition, which I have as a quote on my website. So Michelle, tell us a little bit, uh, are you knowledgeable about inner earth? Apparently there is, there are cities within the earth's surface, uh, the, the crust, so 60 levels down. Are you knowledgeable about that? I don't know a whole lot about that. The only thing I know about is that there are some natural caverns that are very, very big. And I remember uh, there's a, a person who's now well been deceased for quite a while. And we think he was actually killed, but made to look like a suicide. His name was uh, Phil Schneider. And Phil Schneider was uh, an engineer for the U.S. Air Force. And he was his job was to go and excavate or at least uh, explore some caverns because the military at that time were starting to come up with the idea that they wanted to create tunnels that would interconnect the, all the military bases using these tunnel boring machines. Even the Air Force actually owns one of those things. And it, it's a huge worm, a huge metallic machine that can apparently melt uh, rock right down to liquid form and, f and, which, and then uses that liquefied rock to actually make the tunnels interconnecting one base to another and he actually came upon a, a race of beings and there was an ensuing firefight where some on their side got killed some of our, our side got killed humans got killed and he was shot in the chest he survived the blast but he basically said that there was uh they came upon this race of beings that were uh underground but to believe that there's a central core where there's a sun and people living on the inner lining, uh, lining, lining of the, the earth, I don't necessarily believe that. But uh, there are extensive cave systems and something could live down there that cannot um, uh, take in sunlight. Yeah, like we're talking reptilians mostly would be like uh, where they'd be more in, a, in an environment where there's moisture and no, not dryness. So you, you, you never know. I mean, there's on my website, I've listed... Um, thanks to the work of Linda Moulton Howe in the States, I've got 85 species that I've cataloged that have been seen once or twice on the planet, but the uh, the abduction performing ones are on, on a separate page because they come here more repeatedly. And so uh, there's a lot of races out there that are coming here and whether we attracted their attention by detonating that, detonating that bomb back in 1945, which all of a sudden they said, oh my God, the kids have found the matches. <laughs> the sightings were taking place way before that, way back in biblical times. But when we detonated the first atomic bomb in 1945, we kind of gave them the location as to where we were. Right. When we're, I, yeah. Sorry. It sounds a little Jules Verne to me in regards to the center of the earth that he's written about it already. Can we already have these key codes that are within these books and that are the places that we're not really looking at, that we look at is possible fiction. But yeah. when we look at paleontology, archeology, span we're already digging through the ground at several meters underground to find all these civilizations that once were. And it would yeah. it be crazy enough to believe that we are not the proper race that is from this earth, that we were already inhabiting an alien earth, that there were people already underground and we're starting to learn from those archaeological digs? Well, it's possible because there's been, there's been uh, a lot of areas where people have built structure upon structure upon structure and we still don't know. We don't know a whole lot about our, our, our human history. I mean, I, I personally believe that whatever was living here before, like proto-humans, we were tweaked over time, biologically speaking, mm -hmm. like genetically manipulated to have the form that we have today. Now, Bob Lazar, the young scientist who had worked at Area S4, 
had been shown briefings that basically described that over a period of 300,000 years, we had been tweaked about 65 times genetically by one or two particular races, whether it's the Anunnaki or some other founding, uh, you know, the same, the, the teachers who actually taught us how to uh, grow seeds, uh, uh, have, have different uh, crops and our languages too, because even in the, uh, in it's obvious to me that they have taught, us things and may be part of our creation because in abduction cases, if you're German and you get abducted, the telepathic message you get in your head is actually German. If you're French, it's the same thing. You get your French messages in your head saying, we won't harm you, be calm, everything will be okay, you know, and they're just taking us, it's, to me, it's, uh, the abductions is a, a, a way by, by which uh, they are just keeping tabs on our development since they're the ones who helped to create us. Although I still believe that they don't know where our soul came from. That's something else. That's something else that they can't explain that just that they can't explain our emotions. And that's why they're studying us at the same time as, you know, the, the races that are coming here that may not have had anything to do with our development or, or, or accelerated uh, genetically uh, genetic manipulation. They're curious about those, uh, those aspects of us, our soul, our memories, our, our, our emotions. And so uh, I don't know if the uh, abductions have dwindled over the years since, since the last two years or with COVID or what, but because um, we can't attend any conferences anymore, we can't find out any more than, than I used to when I used to go to Toronto to attend all the conferences, but uh, I'm sure that it's still going on. Well, it wouldn't be too far off of thinking of the dialect in regards to it because we're already using Google translation to be able to help us along with language so if we're yeah. talking about advanced beings i wouldn't think that it would be too far off and that they would have that technology to be able to transmit whatever they needed to transmit we already have things in our ears hearing what we need to hear yeah. we're already developing vocal <laughs> people who have hard time speaking we have vocal magnifiers so i can i can already see that happening when you speak about biblical times I, I come back to the, the genesis or the, the beginning story of time. And even in the Quran, when they speak about these giants, Adam and Eve, that ended up falling to earth. And they ended up meeting each other, one in uh, Mecca, the other in India, and it only took a day for them to meet because they were giants. I, are we, when we speak about even the Anunnaki, when we speak about the other cultures that are within that Kabbalah flower, and we learn about this, are we not already an alien race? Have we already not come to inhabit this earth from another sphere? When we're talking, even when we're talking about Sudbury, Ontario is an alien ground because we have all of these alien minerals that are within our platform. We have copper and ore and we have uh, from the refineries, we have the sulfur and we're the capital of the world in nickel. So are they coming back for what was already theirs in the beginning? Are they finding that trace of going back to that and they found that signature? I think they've never left. I think they've been keeping a close eye. I, I, my personal belief is that since the astronauts went to the moon, uh, they found they've they found evidence, or there seems to be indication that there is a large complex on the other side of the moon. So they they've been using the moon as a duck blind for many many years or, or decades, just keeping a watch. And uh, occasionally, when they do need minerals, like you're talking about gold, gold being a very good conductor for electronics. Um, I'm not surprised that they would surface and show up at mine sites, you know, either, either excavating or taking samples or whatever, just like in the movie E.T. when they come down and take samples of flowers, take samples of, of people, you know, and, and animals. That's why you'd have the cases of animal mutilations. Uh, for whatever reason, they're using the blood for something. But you, did you know that the cow blood is actually the closest thing to human blood? It can actually be used in medic medevac situations as a replacement because the the hemoglobin hemoglobin is pretty well similar. Yeah, yeah we, we've we actually thought, had a show yeah, we were, about DNA and how pigs are close to our DNA and mm. the reasons why a lot of our uh, religious uh, brothers and and sisters do not eat pork. Okay, well that explains it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> fact. I'm glad that you brought that up. Something yeah. that I didn't know. Yeah. Both Michelle and Jenny, you know, this is such a, a great and exciting show, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Michelle, is there any way we could have you back somehow, somewhere in the near future? Oh, that's, that's definitely possible. I mean, this, this time frame is perfect for me. And next so, time we'll have to talk about Spooky Sudbury, the spooky book Sudbury, from uh, yeah. Mark Leslie and Jenny Jellin. <laughs> All these For wonderful sure. stories that are within. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, well, the uh, the articles, I mean, my website is based on the newspaper articles from the Sudbury Star. And uh, the earliest articles I went, I went as far back as the 1800s, which was called the uh, Sudbury Journal back then. But couldn't find anything at all uh, looking for airship sightings of the 1800s uh, like they, did, they had in the States. But then... Uh, at the turn of the century, I found an article in 1914 and 1916, which was pretty interesting because I found out after that the first flight from anywhere to anywhere was from Toronto, and it was 1919. So what was flying at night with a light on in 1914 or 1916? You so, want to yeah. hear a funny story, Michelle? I am sure. the great, great, great granddaughter of James Alexander Orr. The first journalist of Subbury, founder of the Subbury Journal. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about full circle, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. See, that was a grandma thing. Grandma made that happen. Cool. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yes. Jenny well, who knows? We can maybe find out for you. Yeah. Jenny Michelle, thank you so much for joining us, uh, joining us on our show. Jenny, you did such a fantastic job uh, replacing uh, Esther. You got the job for the next occasion. <laughs> I could have but, never replaced her. <laughs> She's amazing. No, if she I better be replaced. I like my Stella eyebrows from, uh, from uh, <laughs> Daily Struggles. And, <laughs> and you know what? Self. <laughs> if one day I can be here, you know what? You're going to be an excellent replacement for me too. Jen, thank you so much for producing the show and for being thank such you. a great friend and co-host, Michelle. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll be speaking soon. So, folks, Thanks, next week, same time, same place, same reason, right here, Wednesdays at noon. And don't forget to tune in every Saturday on accessradio.ca when we have the extended version of our show between noon and 3 p.m. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now.